Hi, this is Simon Buckingham Shum, and I'm delighted to present this work at the first Quantitative Ethnography Conference here uh, on behalf of uh, Roberto Martinez Maldonado and Vanessa Echeverria, who has been leading a lot of this work as part of her PhD. We'll be presenting the multimodal matrix as a quantitative ethnography methodology. And uh, I hope that you'll find this interesting and look forward to hearing from you afterwards. Well, just to set the scene, the promise of big data, uh, many people have talked about this, of course, but um, I think about it as follows. Um, there are many societal systems out there now with digital infrastructure and the big data revolution is um, to me most interesting because it allows us to monitor these complex societal systems in new ways by now allowing us to perform data analysis at, at new kinds of speeds and scales of course in order to gain some kind of timely insight and action and the idea that we can monitor complex social human and machine technical systems at scale is, is a very exciting one for us um, of course, here at the Quantitative Ethnography Conference, we're particularly interested in human activity systems, not just machines processing data and talking to other machines. And of course, it is here that we have a, a profound methodological challenge, namely, how do we handle this intersection with integrity? And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what integrity might mean. Um, my own particular context, uh, the context in which we're working, is, is that of education, learning and teaching as a complex human activity system, and the power of data science and analytics to shed insights, uh, shed uh, uh, light on, on what's going on there with learning and teaching. And um, um, our approach is to take a human-centered design approach, which provides us with an array of different tools and uh, lenses for thinking about how we do handle that intersection with integrity. So for example, on the one hand, we have fields such as human computer interaction, educational data and AI ethics and educational science and technology studies that give us ways of asking good questions about, well, what exactly is the relationship between uh, the data that's being gathered and this mysterious process called learning, or what kinds of actionable insights could a teacher really gather from um, an activity trace of, of their teaching. And then of course, because we are talking about learning and teaching, we have education and the learning sciences and the assessment sciences, all providing us with an array of tools and methodologies and language to establish the relationship between a construct that we might be looking to assess and its relationship to data, behavioral data from the learners. Now these are very useful, but um, as I hope uh, to illustrate, I think that there's still a missing link in there about exactly how we, um, we scale the analysis of, of human activity data using quantitative techniques. And this, of course, is the QE uh, niche, uh, potentially. Now, let's switch to thinking about the actual context that is driving our work. This is um, training nurses to respond well as a team to a critical change in a patient's condition. So we're looking at co-located teamwork here. And um, these, these kinds of simulation wards are used widely um, around the world in universities and hospitals. At UTS, uh, here in Sydney, we might have five or six teams in action, as you can see from that top level video camera shot recording the ward. Um, but there is typically just one instructor, perhaps, who is coordinating the whole session. So our intuition, when we uh, started to understand how um, these 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 uh, teaching wards operate was that they could be scoped to augment the feedback to teachers and students by using the new emerging 
uh, array of multimodal sensors and ways of analyzing those. So this was, this was the informal intuition. The question is, uh, well, is that really possible? So multimodal learning analytics, as it's called, allows us to basically instrument the room. The room can now become aware of what is going on inside it. There is a patient simulator, uh, a mannequin on the bed there, so the students can practice without actually damaging any real people. And that, depending on the resolution of that mannequin, it may be streaming all sorts of data off it, depending on uh, how it's uh, treated or measurements are taken. Um, the nurse, the, the trainee nurses are wearing localization badges, so we can track their movement around this space. We are recording audio, and they're also wearing wristbands, streaming different kinds of physiological data. We're going to be particularly interested in electrodermal activity. So this is, uh, in principle, uh, uh, an interesting multimodal analytics opportunity. Um, however, simply generating a deluge of data begs the question, well, how do we actually make sense of this? And could we even do this in close to real time in order to generate meaningful feedback to staff and students straight after a debrief, uh, straight after a simulation session in their debrief, for example? And in the context of this conference, we're going to be interested in, well, the contributions that quantitative ethnography can make and perhaps how what we've been doing feeds back contributions to you as a wider community. And just to note, for reference, um, the, um, the team that uh, uh, David Schaefer leads has, has already prototyped um, one tool for generating real-time feedback for teachers um, using epistemic network analysis. Uh, they, can, they, they, they reported um, a dashboard that they uh, prototyped and evaluated for feeding back to teachers what was going on in um, an online learning uh, uh, environment. What we're trying to do is sort of by analogy the same thing using quantitative ethnography principles but for co-located teamwork, face-to-face -face teamwork. And as far as we know, this is the first time that anybody tries, has tried to do this. So there's um, our holy trinity of learning, analytics, and human-centered design techniques. And we're gonna be using the colors here to talk about the respective contributions they make uh, when we're trying to bring diverse analytical techniques and data together. So from the learning and teaching, we're gonna be drawing from the literature in CSCL and um, um, the insights we get from assessment science into how one designs um, an assessment tool. We'll also be drawing from human-centered design techniques, which uh, are, offer us another array of tools for understanding the activity um, system. Observations of the simulations as they are currently run. Interviews with the expert educators about what they believe to be the biggest challenges, as well as running co-design co sessions with educators and students to help give them a voice in shaping the design. So we used co-design techniques, as mentioned, to try and elicit the perspectives that students and educators have. They know nothing about multimodal data and analytics, but they, they certainly can speak about their experience as teachers and as students. So we used co-design techniques such as teacher superpowers, where we, we asked teachers to imagine they had superpowers that would allow them to uh, give better feedback to students. What exactly would they like to know and what would they say to them? We worked with students as well, um, asking them to uh, draw the journeys that they went on when they went through a simulation exercise. And these generate all sorts of artifacts which we've described elsewhere. Um, but the, the, the key point is that these co-design techniques allow us to uh, not only understand the current human activity system, but also to envisage 
of potential future system because of course we are trying to design uh, an artifact which will change the nature of the activity in the future if it's successful. Another example of understanding human activity system is we start with you know a very data science approach where we can track the location each of those data points shown on the left there of the nurses uh, then we move to a higher order abstraction where we temporarily segment into three phases t1 2 and 3 and generate heat maps which which um, you know aggregate uh, and give us a, a visual indicator of how much time students spent in different locations but the key insight was when we were showing these to the educators and learning that um, really there are five meaningful zones in this kind of simulation. Of course, in other kinds of simulations, the zones might be different. So this is highly contextual to the activity. And those are shown in summary there on the, on the figure. Depending on where the student is, we're really interested in whether they're in one of those five zones. We also draw from uh, CSCL research, uh, looking at um, the uh, uh, how can we describe um, co-located collaboration. And we're using the ACAD framework, which is from some of our prior work, um, which talks about um, three key um, dimensions we might want to focus on. The set, which is the, the physical and digital space and the objects and the input devices, the hardware and the software, the furniture. The things that um, create the, uh, the, the environment in which the, the team is working. We want to talk about the epistemic tasks, which are the actual uh, you know, activities that they engage in concerned with, with the use of and the acquisition and generation of knowledge. And the social situation, which refers to the ways in which people can group together or um, have either scripted or emerging roles and how they might divide up labor. Uh, to these three dimensions we also added affective responses because the literature on healthcare simulation research and medical training points to the importance of these emotional uh, affective responses um, in, in students learning. So we're pulling in from the blue, the orange and the pink colors here and we want to bring these all together. Uh, we want to move from multimodal log data to higher order constructs which we might think of as, as codes which are going to serve as proxies to giving meaningful feedback on codes with a big C such as delivering patient-centered care. That is a concept that, uh, uh, that the, the educators want the students to grasp. In fact that is a curriculum outcome. Patient-centered care and effective teamwork, uh, those are, those are, that's language that we can use to give meaningful feedback. The theoretical constructs break down from the ACAD framework into the PISA uh, acronym there, physical, epistemic, social and effective, and we can decompose those constructs into a number of sub-constructs, all of which drive um, uh, the higher order constructs. And then finally we get down to the multimodal data. Uh, and this is where we can actually detect behaviors uh, from the digital data. Um, now the question is how does that all come together into an integrated database? So we're going to group our data into the four categories from our theoretical perspective. Um, as you will be familiar with from any kind of uh, you know, data uh, matrix representation and in particular the work on quantitative ethnography, we're interested in time because it's about activity unfolding under uh, over time. And here we're gonna segment time by the second because we're interested in uh, quite fine-grained um, analysis. We can, however, group time into more meaningful higher order constructs. In this case, phase one and two before and after a critical patient incident might be defined. Then we have our data columns. 
And we will drill into those in a moment, but these are coming from multimodal observations of what was going on in the activity. And finally, we can populate our matrix with a mix of numerical and categorical data. And um, each line is giving us a description within that period of what all the different nurses, the RNs, one, two, etc., were doing, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what kinds of data they were streaming. And we'll drill down into those column types a little further now. So, for example, our understanding that there were five key zones allows us to define registered nurses one, two, three, and four, however many nurses were in the team, as to which zone they were in with a one or a zero. And that can be done automatically from machine coding of the positional data. The raw accelerometer data from the wristbands is classified again into low, medium, and high categories this time, um, as shown in that column there, um, which is uh, our categories based on the nursing literature. The electrodermal traces, uh, we want to really just focus on particular phenomena such as peaks, and peaks that are also associated with low physical activity because that suggests that something emotional or cognitive is going on in the brain. And that can be coded by machine as well, by identifying those peaks. We have human observers engaged in human coding here with a tablet who are watching the activity and clicking uh, on a button when a student engages in a particular um, epistemic task, such as administering medicine, uh, uh, administering CPR, etc. Those are the epistemic activities. And finally, there are social activities. Now, we had intended that the microphones would pick up who was talking when, uh, but the wards were so noisy that in the end we actually had to have a researcher do this from the video. And so that was human coded in the end, and that populated the social columns. So, Having generated this multimodal matrix through a mix of human and machine gathered data and coding, we want to then generate feedback. There's no point having the data there without having something to show for it. So um, what you'll see now are just glimpses of the visualizations that we are experimenting with. But note that social, physical, spatial, and temporal relationships are key here, which um, echoes the focus on relationships and connections from the quantitative ethnography work in techniques such as ENA. So we have generated a sociogram type representation. We have generated a timeline showing orange peaks of arousal from the wristbands. We have generated a sort of patient-centered uh, movement graph showing the nurses and how long they spent in each of the simulation zones. And we've generated a time, what we call the team timeline, which shows the critical actions performed by the nurses. And in fact, this timeline we can now generate within a few minutes of the simulation ending in order to assist the debriefing. And we now are now um, analyzing data from user studies, which we look forward to reporting in the future about the actual efficacy of these visualizations for provoking reflection and productive discourse. Just to clarify, um, this is not a fully automated then workflow. Um, I have emphasized where we have uh, manual interventions uh, in the central column there um, in order to generate those different visualizations. So just to wrap up, we started by asking, how do we make this intersection one we can handle with integrity? And I've tried to indicate how the multimodal matrix is uh, allowing us to uh, create uh, mappings that are principled, drawing on theory and consultation with experts and observation and co-design techniques from HCI in order to understand that human activity system and what meaningful proxies 
might be uh, when we are looking at low-level data. We asked what contributions QE can make, and many of the principles from the quantitative ethnography uh, book uh, underpin the way we thought about the design of the multimodal matrix. And we also asked, could this work make any contributions back to QE? And we'd like to suggest that the multimodal matrix may be a representation that you would be interested in. And also that uh, we have generated um, um, visual feedback for different kinds of users from co-located activity analysis, which we think is the first time this has been done um, so far. So just to conclude then, we think that this work is building on and augmenting QE as follows. We need to understand human activity systems, the big D discourse, big C codes, and we've used an array of techniques to give insight into both current and envisioned practices. We need to integrate qualitative and quantitative data, small d and small c discourse and codes, and the multimodal matrix gives us a way to handle that heterogeneous data. We need analysis techniques that can both read from and write to a common data representation, and we have demonstrated how that can be done with the multimodal matrix. And finally, we need to be able to partially or even fully automate analysis at scale when we are dealing with large data sets and visualize this for users to make it useful. And we have il illustrated how far we have got so far in our work around co-located teamwork analytics. Thanks very much indeed.